So how do we treat heart failure in 2024 and beyond? A lot has changed in the last two years. In the last two years, the, the latest guidelines were released in 2022, but there have been some updates by the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association on how to treat heart failure appropriately because we have some new amazing medications that have come out, including the Ozempics and the Wegovies and you know the Manjaros and all that. And we'll talk about it. We'll dive deep. My name is Dr. Allo. I'm a double board certified cardiologist. For those of you who don't know me, I'm also an obesity medicine specialist. I've been helping people lose weight for a very, very long time. So let's get to it. How do you treat heart failure? If you've watched some of my older videos at medical conferences when I'm teaching cardiology board review and how to treat heart failure, we've known for almost 20 years or maybe even 30 years that the lower the blood pressure, Regardless almost of how you lower it, cardiac output improves and cardiac output goes up. Other than if you, you know, weaken the squeeze, like certain calcium channel blockers in the past, they might weaken the squeeze and that, you know, ruins cardiac output. So when the heart squeezes, this little, you know, fun muscle right here, when it squeezes, the blood that goes forward is called cardiac output. There's two basic kinds of heart failure. There's one where the squeeze is weaker. We call that systolic heart failure because this is the systole part of the heart cycle, the heart squeezes, that's one third of the cycle, and then the other two thirds is kind of relaxing. The second part of systole is that it's not relax. the second part, the second type of heart failure is the heart doesn't relax enough, and that is called diastole or diastolic heart failure. So how does this work? When the heart does it, when the heart squeezes, uh, it pushes blood forward. When it's weak and squeezing, it's not pushing enough blood forward, blood backs up into your lungs, into your neck veins, into your legs and what have you, and that is called heart failure. So how does it happen when the heart just isn't relaxing enough? That's called diastolic heart failure or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is the part, is the amount of blood that's squeezed out. So when, when a normal heart squeezes, about 55, maybe 65% of the blood that's in that final pumping chamber squeezes out. And if that drops to like 35, 25, 45, what have you, that's called systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The ejection fraction goes down. The percentage of blood ejected is the ejection fraction. In preserved ejection fraction, heart failure, you have the same problem, but the heart isn't able to push as much blood forward because it's not filling enough. And this happens in a few cases. So when the heart relaxes, Part of that relaxation phase is to suck blood out of your lungs. That is one of the ways in which it fills up. When the atria contracts, that also causes it to fill up. So when it relaxes, if the left ventricle, that final pumping chamber, fills up about 80%, and then that final atrial squeeze is the other 20%, and then it can squeeze it all forward. People with atrial fibrillation, where the top two chambers aren't squeezing, they, they lose that atrial kick, they lose that 20%. So sometimes cardiac output goes down because they're not getting that atrial kick or that you know final 20%, which helps some people's cardiac output. And some people are dependent on it. They are dependent on that atrial kick. That's why we now recommend if somebody has atrial fibrillation to try to get them back into a normal heart rhythm. That improves cardiac output. So historically, Almost anything that has lowered blood pressure for the longest time we have known improves heart failure outcomes. This is like the three beta blockers, metoprolol succinate, carvedilol, and bisopropylol. We know that nitrates and hydralazine do that. If you reduce blood pressure, the heart doesn't have to squeeze as hard against a high pressure uh, gradient or a high pressure closed system. So you're unloading the heart. The heart doesn't have to squeeze as, squeeze as hard. You have the aorta, the big artery coming out. If you drop the pressure in the aorta, the heart's pumping like 20%. Now that the pressure is lower, it can actually squeeze out a little bit more and they won't be in as much heart failure. So historically, things that lower your blood pressure like lisinopril, losartan, hydralazine, certain types of nitrates, things like that have always shown an improved cardiac output. Now though, we have medications that work even better. They affect a lot of the hormonal issues. We still use ACE inhibitors and ARBs, we usually start with ACE inhibitors, but there is a class of medications that we we're supposed to use before that. This is called the ARNIs. This is the Entresto, which is the sacbutyl valsartan combination. Entresto unloads the heart a lot. As you'll notice, a lot of people's blood pressures really drops when you put them on this combination. And that's the one way it works. This is the first line of medication. There's four medications people need to be on and a fifth one, which is a bonus, which I'll talk about at the end. Number one should be an ARNI. This is like Entresto. If they can't be on an RNA or it's too expensive or their insurance isn't covering it, you can use an ACE inhibitor like lisinopril or ramipril or an ARB 
like Losartan, Valsartan, etc. Now, Entresto does include Valsartan in it. So that is step number one. That Those three or four medications is the first step. Number two, you have to put them on in what we call an SGT, SGLT2 uh, inhibitor. These are like Invokana, Jardians, and Farsiga. These are originally started out as diabetes medications, but because of the way they affect hormones, they basically are almost like diuretics. They make you pee out sugar. Obviously, diabetes, you know, people with diabetes, the more sugar they eliminate or the less sugar they have um, in terms of in their bloodstream, the better. This makes you pee out excess blood sugar. When your blood sugar is about over 140, Invokana, Farsiga, and Jardia sort of make you pay, pee out those excess calories and the excess sugar. It's a bit of a diuretic effect. And uh, in addition to that, affecting the hormonal uh, milieu. The next medication that you should be on would be something called an aldosterone antagonist. This is like spironolactone and eplerinone. Those are the two that we usually use. Spironolactone is older. It's a little more generic. It's usually cheaper, but eplerinone is generic now and you can use it. The only difference being is that spironolactone blocks testosterone. Most men don't like that. They get some maybe breast tenderness, um, some gynecomastia, you know, some feminizing type symptoms, and they might not like it, we would switch them to a player known. The dosing is almost uh, exactly the same. The next uh, class of medications that we put people on are obviously the tried and true beta blockers. And I'm not saying you have to do these in an exact order. They should be on all four regardless. These are beta blockers. The only two that we currently use that are approved in heart failure are metoprolol succinate, not tartrate, the long-acting one, the one that usually goes by the brand name Toprol, and carvedilol. Carvedilol is the other one uh, that is proven to benefit in heart failure. M both of them also kind of affect scarring and you know, myocardial you know, tissues, my myocardium not becoming myofibrotic or like, you know, scar tissue. It helps the myocardium squeeze harder and better. Um, similar to ACEs and ARBs and kind of all these, you know, newer medications. Those are the main four medications in 2024 that you want to be using. I will admit that it's not that easy to get patients on all of these. The problem is blood pressure. We want to use these medications as opposed to diuretics. We don't want to use loop diuretics all the time. Only if they're volume overloaded, we would diurese the heck out of them and then try to get them onto these medications. The problem is a lot of patients' blood pressure really, really drops, and it's hard to put them on the therapeutic doses of these. So a lot of times the guidelines recommend they should be on all four. A patient can't be discharged from the hospital or in your practice, not on all four because you're not meeting the guidelines. In that scenario, you could put them on a low dose ramipril, which has minimal effect on blood pressure. You could put them on lisinopril 2.5. And this is like, if you don't, if they're not telling the Entresto or it's too expensive and they can't be on it, you can get them on the lower dose like lisinopril 2.5 or ramipril, either dose 5 or 10. Both have almost no effect uh, on blood pressure. Ramipril at the highest dose, which is 10 milligrams, only lowers your blood pressure by three points systolic blood pressure. So that's what you want to do. Spironolactone definitely works. You also may want to lower the dose like tw you know, 12 and a half or 25 if they can't tolerate it. Metoprolol, similarly, you can go to 12 and a half once a day. Carvedilol, you can go to 3.125 twice a day. You know, there's all kinds of things you can do to kind of make sure they are on guideline directed therapy. Farsiga and uh, Jardians, both are like the 10 milligram dose, the non-diabetes, you know, lower dose, the heart failure dose. Now, that's what you want to do because if you're not on those four medications, they are not going to be guideline directed therapy, not guideline compliant. You could get dinged as a provider for not being somebody who's up to date on the guidelines, which no one wants to do. The problem with the Farsigas and Jardiances is they may or may not get approved, or if they do, they're at a higher copay and the patient might not want it. That can definitely be an issue. You have to document that we did put the patient on it, but they never picked it up or they don't want it because it's just too expensive for them or they just don't want to take it, what have you. The bonus now is GLP-1s. This is like Ozempic. There is a dose of Ozempic, the highest dose, the 2.4, which was tested in patients with preserved ejection fraction. This is the diastolic heart failure patients where it showed an improvement in symptoms. And I did a whole podcast on that. Search my podcast, Dr. Allo Show, on your favorite podcast player and search for uh, does Ozempic improve heart failure? Something to that effect. Ozempic cures heart failure. I think that's the title of it. Check that one out. You'll see I'll go through the entire study with semaglutide and how it improved outcomes in patients with preserved ejection fraction. Now, 
one thing we know is patients with diastolic heart failure usually are more overweight. And almost any treatment that we have found that improves obesity or reduces calorie, caloric intake or reduces weight seems to help with the preserved ejection fraction types of heart failure. And like an example of that would be Jardians and Farsiga. They make you pee out sugar. They make you pee out calories. Any other medication that we've used in the past to help people lose weight similarly has improved heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So that's the bonus one that you can use. That's the fifth class of medications. It's only a matter of time before that gets added to the guidelines where somebody now also has to be on those. Now, obviously, if a patient is hospitalized and they're fluid overloaded, you have to use Lasix. You have to use maybe metolazone, what have you, to get fluid off quickly, but then get them onto the guideline-directed therapy so that when they're discharged home, they are on medications that they can go home on that are stable, that can help them, that they will do very, very well on. I highly recommend you join my community if you like this kind of stuff. Go to drallo.net slash community. Type in the code one month, one M-O-N-T-H, and you can get in there for free. Cancel at any time. You will absolutely love it in there. You get to meet me and all my friends and talk heart disease, longevity, lipids, all day, all night, either through an app, texting, posting pictures of your lipids, your coronary scans, your echograms, or um, use jumping on the Zoom lives that we do every week. So love to see you in there. Check out the next video.